Welcome to Voice of the Vatican, our top stories. Hope amidst destruction. As the smoke clears, a single cross is discovered untouched amongst the ashes of the Fort McMurray Canada fire. Feeding the hungry. A group determined to fight poverty and founded on the principles outlined by Pope John Paul II's encyclical Centesimus Annus gets a special meeting with Pope Francis. Brutal attack. A priest in northern Vietnam attacked viciously while on his way to celebrate the Holy Mass. Library on loan. The Vatican and the University of Notre Dame have teamed up, giving American academics access to the treasured works of the Vatican Library. Baby bonus. Italy's health minister develops a plan to counter the culture of death in the country and promote an Italian baby boom. Fighting for death. Canada moves to legalize third-party suicide, a move counter to its own history, law, and the very practice of good medicine. Building bridges. A Catholic bishop from Pakistan crosses contested borders into India, leading a pilgrimage with a message of peace. A moment of consolation. An American woman with terminal stage four cancer is tenderly embraced by the Holy Father in St. Peter's Square. Mercy Friday. Pope Francis stops by with a personal message of hope and mercy for a large home for the disabled in Rome. And a Marian celebration. Guests invited to the birthday party of a five-year-old girl in Portugal got a surprise of their own when they found out the party's theme. And wait until you hear what it was. I'm Ashley Norona in Rome, Italy, and you're watching Voice of the Vatican, only on Shalom World TV. The flames in the Fort McMurray, Canada fire have scorched more than 700,000 acres and reduced more than 2,400 buildings to ashes. But against all odds, a sign of hope survived the wrath of the flames. When the flames subsided near Fort McMurray, cleanup crews were amazed to discover that there was one thing left unharmed. Somehow the flames parted around a small wooden memorial cross. Michael Leclerc was only 29 years old when a car crash took his life six years ago. His uncle, who had raised Michael, had built the roadside memorial and hired a friend to make the wooden cross that held Michael's photo. Michael's aunt and uncle were forced to flee Fort McMurray because of the fire and lost their home of 18 years and all of the mementos of their beloved nephew. From the safety of an evacuation center, the couple looked at photos of the destruction. But to their delight and disbelief, they caught sight of Michael's wooden memorial cross, the one thing left still standing amongst the ruins. We're praying for all those who've lost their property, belongings, and memories. And this cross that stood tall among the ruins reminds us that Christ, through His cross, entered into the mystery of human suffering, giving it new meaning, and granting us the gift of endurance to carry our own crosses throughout our pilgrim journey on Earth. Their mission is sharing this church's social teachings on economics to the world, and their name is the Centesimus Annus Pro Pontifice Foundation. And they recently gathered in Rome for a three-day event with the theme, Business Initiative and the Fight Against Poverty, the Refugee Emergency, Our Challenge. The highlight for the participants was a special meeting with the Holy Father. Itasi. The fight against poverty is not merely a technical economic problem, but above all, a moral one, calling for global solidarity and the development of more equitable approaches to the concrete needs and aspirations of individuals and peoples worldwide. In the light of this demanding task, this initiative of your foundation is most timely, drawing inspiration from the rich patrimony of the Church's social doctrine the present conference is exploring, from various standpoints, the practical and ethical implications of the present world economy, while at the same time laying the foundations for a business and economic culture that is more inclusive and respectful of human dignity. 
The organization was inspired by the teachings from the encyclical Centesimus Annus, promulgated 25 years ago by Pope John Paul II on May 1st of 1991. And they make heartfelt endorsement of papal social teachings and offer committed support of the Holy Father's charitable initiatives. The Holy Father spoke to the members about what happens when the meetings in Rome are over. It is my hope that your conference will contribute to generating new models of economic progress more clearly directed to the universal common good, inclusion and integral development, the creation of labor, and investment in human resources. In this week's public papal audience address, the Holy Father said, to ignore the poor is to despise God, and urged all Catholics to feed the hungry and clothe the poor with love. Father Joseph Nguyen Van Thê is the assistant of Dong Chuang Parish in the northern Vietnam Diocese of Bac Ninh, and was traveling to celebrate Mass in a remote area of the diocese when four criminals in masks approached him on motorcycles, jumped down and attacked him with batons, sticks and iron bars. The motivation behind the attack was that recently Father Joseph had bravely criticized the corruption of police and local authorities in that region. The priest sustained serious injuries to his hands and feet and is currently hospitalized. We join the church in Vietnam in praying for Father's full recovery and for all those who throughout the world suffer for bearing witness to the truth. The University of Notre Dame, a U.S. university named after Our Lady, and the Biblioteca Apostolica Vaticana, better known as the Vatican Library, formalized a unique agreement of collaboration this week. With the agreement, the two institutions will organize visits and informal exchanges of faculty, of scholars, librarians, and administrators. And there will also be the possibility of hosting joint conferences, lecture series, art exhibitions, and even musical and theatrical performances, as well as exploring the development of joint programs of research. The Vatican Library's holdings include some 80,000 manuscripts, plus 100,000 archival documents, and more than 1.5 million printed books, over 200,000 photographs, and 300,000 coins and medals. The oldest documents in the library date back to the first century. Archbishop Jean-Louis Bruget, archivist and librarian of the Holy Roman Church, said at the official ceremony that he hoped the arrangement would enhance the presence of the Vatican Library in the United States and the world, and help the treasures reach a larger public. This is the only collaboration of this sort between the Vatican Library and an American institution. Through this joint venture, we pray that the fruit of the gospel may further penetrate universities and academia throughout the United States. Italy is dying. Birth statistics in Italy report that only 488,000 babies were born in Italy in 2015. That's fewer than in any year since the modern state was founded in 1861. In a country of less than 60 million, this brings the birth rate in Italy to a mere 1.39. Italy has one of the lowest birth rates in Europe, and according to Italy's health minister Beatrice Lorenzen, quote, if we carry on as we are and fail to reverse the trend, there will be fewer than 350,000 births a year in 10 years' time. That's 40% less than in 2010. She called it an impending apocalypse. So Italy's health minister has outlined plans to combat the slow death of Italy by doubling the child benefit monthly bonus to 160 euro, which would be twice the current 80 euro, which is the equivalent of about 90 US dollars. Ms. Lorenzen also called for higher payments for second and subsequent children to encourage larger families. Sadly, the low birth rate in Italy and in most of Europe is the result of a culture of death which is leading the continent to demographic suicide. We hope that this effort on the behalf of the Italian government may serve as a wake-up call to urge people to open their hearts and to embrace an authentic love of life. The government of Canada, under the leadership of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, is attempting to pass a bill to amend the Criminal Code of Canada and allow for the provision of euthanasia and assisted suicide there. Cardinal Thomas Collins of Toronto wrote that, quote, At first sight, it may seem an attractive option, a quick and merciful escape from the suffering that can be experienced in life. 
but fuller reflection reveals its grim implications, not only for the individual, but for our society, and especially for those who are most vulnerable. Such fuller reflection, said the Cardinal, is sorely needed. A group called the Catholic Civil Rights League in Canada has been helping foster that fuller reflection amongst Canadians, helping those to see that, in the words of Cardinal Collins, our priority should be fostering a culture of love and enhancing resources for those suffering and facing death. The Catholic Civil Rights League is a national lay organization formed in 1985 to assist in creating conditions within which Catholic teachings could be better understood to cooperate with other organizations in defending civil rights in Canada, and to oppose defamation and discrimination against Catholics on the basis of their beliefs. We spoke to Alexander MacDonald of the Catholic Civil Rights League about what the bill attempts to do from a legal perspective and the League's response to it. In Canada, there were upwards of nine attempts to bring euthanasia into our legal system. Every single one of those attempts was defeated soundly by sound majorities in our parliament. Nonetheless, the courts decided to impose this on Canadians, and so they've done so by invalidating the criminal code provision which makes this uh, an illegal act. Now, the Catholic Civil Rights League has been active as an intervener in the court cases, the Catholic Civil Rights League has been active in uh, raising funds to bring public awareness to this very important issue and has been coordinating its uh, movements amongst other uh, Christians and different groups in order to provide some kind of a voiced dissent. Pope Francis stated that care and concern for the final stages of life is all the more necessary today when contemporary society attempts to remove every trace of death and dying. Euthanasia and assisted suicide are serious threats to families worldwide, says the Holy Father. As a result of the proposed legislation, Catholics throughout the country have united behind the Catholic bishops of Canada to create a haven of hope. Those people who are practicing Catholics are more informed than ever about their faith and it is forcing us to defend ourselves, forcing us all to become better Catholics, better apologetic, uh, apologists, and also to pray more about this and to pray about the conversion of our society. This bill is the result of what Pope Francis has referred to many times as our throwaway culture, where life has no value. As our Holy Father suggests, the defense of human life is done most effectively by demonstrating the beauty of life. Borders, even contentious ones, crumble in the face of unity in Christ. A bus full of pilgrims from Pakistan and led by a Pakistani bishop crossed a disputed border into the country of India, traveling 13 hours to reach the capital of Delhi. The two countries have fought several wars and conflicts since their independence in 1947, but this pilgrimage, with a message of peace and reconciliation, sought to bring the two rivals closer. They once shared the seat of the Archdiocese of Agra in India, but after the partition and independence in 1947, that changed. Among the many priests present was Indian Jesuit Father Joe Kalatil, who has been working on an initiative with children from various schools in India and Pakistan, encouraging hundreds of students from both countries to exchange letters of friendship. We hope this pilgrimage of peace will encourage a spirit of unity in Christ that transcends borders culture, language, and politics. Fueled by her love of the Holy Father and her Catholic faith, Cheryl Tobin climbed on the back of a chair during a public papal audience in St. Peter's Square, hoping to catch the attention of Pope Francis as he passed. A former master sergeant in the Army Airborne Division, hailing from Clarksville, Tennessee, Cheryl didn't allow her stage four cancer or her prognosis from doctors of only three to nine months to live to prevent her from fulfilling her heart's desire to visit the Eternal City and come face to face with Pope Francis himself. As the Pope was being driven past her and tens of thousands of others after the regular weekly public papal audience, Cheryl balanced herself on top of a plastic chair and waved her arms despite her very frail condition. Suddenly, the guards pointed to her, beckoning her to come forth from the crowd for a special one-on-one -on -one moment with the Holy Father. 
Pope Francis embraced Cheryl and kissed her head, which is bald from chemotherapy and misshapen from repeated skin grafts and operations to remove a tumor at the base of her skull. We pray for Cheryl and for all those who are sick and suffering, especially those who are terminally ill, that all find encouragement in the words of the psalmist and strengthen our God who heals the brokenhearted and binds our wounds. Mercy Fridays. It's an initiative of the Holy Father to perform a public act of mercy on one Friday each month during the Jubilee year. Last month, he visited a refugee camp on the island of Lesbos in Greece. And for May's Mercy Friday, Pope Francis visited the community of Kiko, founded in 1981 to house 18 people with intellectual disabilities. The home is an initiative of L'Arche, founded by Jean Vanier in 1964. L'Arche is active in over 30 countries on five continents and provides loving homes for vulnerable people who live together in a supportive community. The Holy Father shared a snack with residents and volunteers and listened to greetings from eight residents of the community. The Holy Father also toured Kiko's workshop, where residents work daily on crafts. And afterwards, all joined hands while Pope Francis prayed with the residents in the chapel. The Episcopal motto of Our Holy Father is choosing through mercy. And we're grateful to Him for constantly reminding us to come up with new ways to not only accept God's mercy, but to also become channels of mercy to others. Coming up next, we'll go up close with Marion Mulhall, the founder and CEO of World Priest. She's developed an initiative to bring the whole world together in prayer for the sanctification of priests through the World Rosary Relay. And even though Pentecost has gone, the Spirit hasn't. So we'll speak to Father Timothy Furlow for inspiration on how to keep the Spirit alive. And we'll take a look back at a great saint, Pope John Paul II, on what would have been his 96th birthday. But first, more headline news. You've never been to a birthday party quite like this one before. Little Pietra from Portugal didn't ask for the typical princess-themed party for her fifth birthday, but instead asked for a party fit for a queen. That is, the queen of heaven and earth herself. Filled with a deep love of Our Lady, Little Pietra requested a Marian-themed party, and herself dressed in a white gown and blue veil as Our Lady of Grace. A party guest, Camila Lira, wrote a post on Facebook that went viral, saying, Pietra, may you never lose that affection for our mother. You are very special and have moved everyone today. Did you like the program you just watched? Help Shalom World bring more programs like this to a global audience. Your support helps us share the peace of Christ with the world. Visit shalomworld.org forward slash donate. We know that our priests pray for us, but sometimes it's easy to forget how important it is for us to pray for our priests. So pull out your rosary because in just a couple of weeks you can join the world in the seventh annual Global Rosary Relay in an effort to encircle the whole world in prayer for priests. The entire concept of the relay is that at predetermined time slots throughout the day, a particular mystery of the rosary will be prayed at each of the more than 100 participating shrines in more than 50 countries. The event begins at midnight on June 2nd in Siberia, and the rosary then passes to the underground church in China, to New Zealand, to Australia, Europe, and the United States, and to all corners of the earth. The intention of the relay is to give thanksgiving to God for the priests who serve the Catholic Church and to implore the protection and loving care of Our Lady for all her priestly sons. When the clock strikes midnight on the 3rd of June, the entire world will have been encircled in prayer for our priests via this 24-hour relay period of continuous prayer for the ministry of the priesthood. We spoke to Marian Mulhall, CEO of World Priest and founder of the Rosary Relay, who called the event a spiritual revolution and an invitation to the whole world. It's the great gift of this global Rosary Relay means that the entire world uh, of lay people 
and priests for that matter. I mean, priests can pray for priests, of course. So literally the whole world can get involved. And Rome will also get into the action, praying the rosary right from the heart of the church at the Vatican. The most exciting news of all is that this year, uh, the Global Rosary Relay is officially closing the Jubilee for Priests, which begins uh, on the 1st, the 2nd, and, the th and ends on the 3rd of June. And the Jubilee for Priests is a special retreat given by Pope Francis to the priests of the world. But he also encourages people, priests around the world and their bishops to you know, have similar gatherings in, as a retreat for priests. But we've got the incredible gift of um, closing the retreat with the Global Rosary Relay here in St. Peter's Square. Pope Francis has imparted his apostolic blessing on the Rosary Relay. And when the relay was started seven years ago, Pope Benedict XVI also made a lasting contribution. They pray a very, very beautiful prayer, which uh, His Holiness Benedict XVI personally wrote for the Global Rosary Relay as that connecting link of one country passing on to the other. That connecting point is this beautiful prayer um, by His Holiness Benedict XVI. To participate, you can go to www.worldpriest.com to find a participating shrine or to simply join in prayer right where you are. You can watch more of that exclusive interview with Miriam Mulhall at www.shalomworldtv.org slash VOV. On the Feast of Pentecost, Pope Francis celebrated Mass at St. Peter's Basilica with tens of thousands in attendance to commemorate the birthday of the Church. And not far from there, in the Basilica of Mary and the Martyrs in the ancient pantheon in the center of Rome, locals marked the feast with another spectacular tradition. Each year, a group of lucky firefighters are chosen for a special job, and so make their way to the top of the 144-foot-high pantheon dome. This ancient structure in the Guinness Book of World Records for the largest non-reinforced dome, it dates back to 26 BC, was once a Roman temple dedicated to all the pagan gods, and was later converted into a basilica dedicated to Mary and the martyrs. The Pantheon's dome isn't like most others, as its center, called the oculus or eye, is actually wide open. That means it's open to rain, to snow, and to all of the elements, and in this case, open to receiving a deluge of another kind. After the Holy Mass finished, the task of those firefighters was to drop down tens of thousands of red rose petals through the open oculus, raining roses on the mass goers. The rose petals represent the tongues of fire of the Holy Spirit, descending upon the apostles and Our Lady in the upper room. The rose petals fill the pantheon and carpet the floor in red, reminding us of the blood of the martyrs to whom the church is dedicated. It's believed that the tradition of the rose petals in the Pantheon Church goes as far back as 609 AD. As the soft petals gently float down, the choir chants the sequence of Veni Sancti Spiritus. And we rejoice because the Holy Spirit has indeed come. And after all of the celebration of Pentecost is finished, it's important to remember that the spirit of the feast doesn't end on that day. The Spirit is living, and so must be nurtured and nourished to encourage a greater outpouring in our hearts. To help us do just that, we spoke to Father Timothy Furlow, who offered some suggestions on how to keep the Spirit moving after Pentecost and through the rest of the year. One of the best things I think we can do is come to our Lord and say, you know, I acknowledge that you're real. Again, I put my faith in you again. I acknowledge that your Spirit is real and that you're actually, literally living inside of me, and you've given me these gifts. Show me how to use them. I want to use them. Show me how to use them. And according to Father Furlow, this union with the Holy Spirit is also our ticket to true happiness. The Holy Spirit comes to us and he says, you want to love God, right? We say, yeah, I want to love God. That yeah, that yes to the prompt that he gives us, that's his gifts, that's his grace working inside of us. He gives us the ability to actually live virtuously, to actually live the moral life, because that is 
the happiest possible life that we could live as humans. In his Pentecost homily, Pope Francis said the Spirit prepares the heart so that it is able to truly receive the words and example of the Lord. We pray that all of our hearts may be open to receive His gifts profoundly. May 18th marked what would have been the 96th birthday of Pope John Paul II. Carol Joseph Wojtyła was born on May 18th in 1920 in Wadowice, Poland. His early life was marked by great loss. His mother died when he was nine years old, and he was only 12 when his brother Edmund died from scarlet fever, and only 20 when he lost his father. As he grew, he became an accomplished athlete, especially enjoying skiing and swimming, a love that remained with him throughout his lifetime. While at university, he nurtured a love for poetry and theater. But sadly, his university was closed by Nazi troops during the German occupation of Poland. But in his heart, he felt God calling him to the priesthood. So began studying clandestinely at a secret seminary run by the Archbishop of Krakow, trying to escape notice of the Nazis. After World War II ended, he finished his religious studies at a Krakow seminary and was ordained in 1946. Young Wojtyła then spent two years in Rome to finish his doctorate in theology. The rector of his seminary encouraged him to, quote, know Rome, emphasizing the importance of living in the holy city, the place where so many saints had walked before him. In 1978, at the age of only 58, Cardinal Wojtyła was elected Pope, making him the first non-Italian Pope in more than 400 years. As the leader of the Catholic Church, he traveled more than any other Pope before him, visiting more than 100 countries. He was a charismatic figure, and Pope John Paul II used his influence to bring about political change and is credited with the fall of communism in his native Poland. He's also remembered especially for his groundbreaking teachings on the human person, his personalistic theology now known as theology of the body. Pope John Paul II died from complications from Parkinson's on April 2, 2005 at the age of 84. More than three million people waited in line at St. Peter's Basilica to say goodbye to their beloved Pope. He was canonized two years ago on the 27th of April, and his tomb is inside of St. Peter's Basilica, where every day thousands from around the world come to pay their respects to this great man and celebrate Mass at his altar. We ask St. John Paul II for his continued intercession for a new springtime in the Church and the flourishing of family life, an intention which was always close to his heart. As we fondly remember him, we're reminded of his constant total abandonment to God and Mary through his motto, Totus Tuus, and are inspired by his constant encouragement, Duc and Altum, to cast into the deep as fishers of men and to be not afraid as we abandon ourselves with complete trust in God's providence. All week long, you can keep up with the latest happenings in Rome on our Twitter feed, which is at Voice of Vatican. And be sure to like us on our Facebook page at Voice of the Vatican. And keep checking our social media feeds for breaking news and information about upcoming guests and features. And we want to hear your voice too. Email your questions, stories, and news to us at vov at shalomworld.org. This is Ashley Narona in Rome, Italy with Voice of the Vatican saying, Ciao for now from the Eternal City. May God bless you and your family. I'll see you next week on Voice of the Vatican, only on Shalom World TV, from Rome to your home.